Hi. Hi. Oh, uh, I'm a professor here, as you may know, an English professor. I see some of my students. Hi. Um, how many of you, well, this is the novel, Tina Goes to Heaven. Um, I don't know quite what to say about it, but I will, I will think of something, I'm sure. Um, how many of you have heard me read from this before? A few. Okay, I just wanted to be sure I wasn't like reading the same thing to the same people over and over. You know, welcome to the bank robbery again, which I might actually start there. Um, I'm going to read for a while, and I'm going to read that chapter, which is short, uh, about the bank robbery, and then I'm also going to read some some backstory pieces, so they're not spoilers. Right, because they aren't moving the action, the main action forward at all. They're just backstory. So, and I enjoy that that kind of writing quite a bit. So, I think that's what I'll do here. But I always want to start out with the pr prologue, because because it's a novel about a woman leaving a life of prostitution, and it's a funny novel, but. I always want to make sure that I'm telling my readers it prostitution is not funny. It's not funny. People are funny, but prostitution is not. So just because it's not a snicker funny, it's like really funny. But uh, I want to read you the prologue, which I added after I'd had some responses that were snickery. I'm not doing snickers. OK, except the candy bar. Prologue. The Swedes have a word for it, horter, a whore's luck. But really, being a whore in the first place is unlucky, and any luck after that likely to be fleeting, a brief postponement rather than the actual avoidance of trouble and pain. If you come into money, it's quickly stolen. If you make a friend, the friend robs you and disappears. If the sun shines down on you, it reveals the extent of the damage, showing what you have become and what is left to sell. The definition of horter, the good fortune of having your body used by an attractive customer instead of an ugly one, as though desire were any part of the equation. There is no way to be careful enough, let alone lucky enough, to stay OK. You are paid to be invaded, possessed, and dispossessed. You are pierced and bruised, raped and robbed, discarded and scorned. You are 40 times more likely to die this year than your sister, who is not a whore. You are 46 times more likely to be murdered. In that matrix of harm, luck is hard to feature. Maybe a whore's luck means not getting hurt too bad tonight. There is a word for it in Swedish, but the word is meant as a joke. OK. So my protagonist, Tina, bless her heart, um, is in trouble with her pimp. She was sort of thought of herself as his, he was, she was his special girl, so she always, he always took her with him places, and so she thought of herself kind of like maybe he was her boyfriend, although he wasn't. Um, and he's angry at her because of some mistakes that made him look bad, or just accidents that made him look bad. And so she has to figure out how to get away, how to get away. She has no money. She has no relatives. How is she going to get away? So. Um, each one of the chapters has a little epigraph or gram or log epa thing. Um, and some of them are from Anonymous. Okay, they're quotes from Anonymous. And I have to admit that when I need a quote uh, and I can't find a good one, it's all fiction, right? So this one actually wasn't me. I heard somebody say this one. You can't really steal anything. 
You can only take things without knowing what the price will turn out to be. The bank robbery, okay, this is Tina's choice. This is what she's figured out to do. She and her sidekick, Brad. The bank robbery went exactly as Tina had planned, right up to the moment when the old man had the heart attack. That had not been part of the plan. Tina and Brad put on their trench coats as they walked into the bank, pulling first the masks from Freddie's party out of their left-hand pockets, Red Devil for Tina, Bart Simpson for Brad, and when they, those were firmly in place, guns from the right-hand pockets. The child-sized backpacks were folded up under the guns, hidden from view so that the money from the paper bags Tina carried could be concealed for the getaway, all as planned. Both Tina and Brad had seen a lot of bank robbery movies, so they knew they had to yell and call people motherfuckers. I'm sorry if you have a sensitivity. I don't. Um, motherfuckers and threatened to kill them. Brad would have liked to jump up on a desk or vault over a counter, but he wasn't sure he could jump that high, and he didn't want to look stupid on his big day. The bank's customers had seen the same movie, so it all went pretty smoothly. Disarm the security guy, tellers out of the cages, everyone on the floor, face down, arms spread wide, don't be a hero. Brad was confused when the manager he was supposed to take back to the vault was out at a corporate meeting. He said it was totally fucked up, but Tina told him to take the head teller instead. It didn't seem quite right, it wasn't in the plan, but he didn't argue after his first protest. Okay, I'm gonna skip some stuff, la 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 la. Um, just as she realized, Tina, with some irritation that what Brad was shouting in the vault was not to hurry up, motherfucker, or he would shoot, but cowabunga, dude. She no has the Bart Simpson mask on. She noticed that the old Mexican-looking man who had been at the end of the line was wheezing, his hands under him against his chest. She saw his face, pressed against the floor, had turned a bad shade of gray like an old dish rag in a crack house. For a moment, she forgot to yell. Looking around, she spotted a woman in pink scrub shirt with a lollipop print, her hands trembling visibly at the ends of her outstretched arms. Hey, you in the pink thing, are you a nurse? You in the lollipop thing. Tina prodded her with the barrel of her gun. The pink lollipop lady left her face down. Here's an aside. It was not a good day to die, not for her. She was engaged to be married in three weeks. She loved her fiance very much. They had made an offer on a condo. She had four younger sisters she loved, one about to graduate from nursing school, one pregnant. She was much friended on Facebook. Her amusing animal story blog site had received over 12,000 hits in the six months she'd had it up. It was a good day to keep living. She shook her head, she was not a nurse. What are you? I work for a vet, a veterinarian. I help with animals. Please don't hurt me. Come look at this guy. Get up, Lollipop, or I'll shoot you. Get up and come look at this old guy. Lollipop eased up from the floor and crawled cautiously to where Tina, the red devil, was kneeling next to the man, now gasping and moaning, his eyes squeezed shut, as though in an attempt to block out light or pain or both. Why is he that color? Is he faking it? The devil asked in an ordinary, non-bank robbing voice. I don't know. I just see animals all day, and they mostly stay the same color. <laughs> because of the fur. Sometimes a cat with pink lips can look kind of pale like this. I can't help it. I don't see people. I think he's probably sick, though. OK, Lolly. Help me roll him over and then get back down, or I'll start shooting. Ready? One, two, three, over. The old man gasped as they rolled him over, and he settled on his back like a landed fish, trying to curl around the pain, trying to breathe. Tina took his hand, so cold and clammy, and smoothed his forehead because that's what they do when someone's sick. Anybody moves gets a bullet in the head. Stay the fuck down, she yelled at the room, then looked down at her patient again. Beads of moisture twinkled in his gray mustache. I'm dying, please help me, he pushed out between gritted teeth. 
When he opened his eyes and saw the face of the red devil looking down on him, he began to cry in earnest, El Diablo, help me, sweet mother of God, Santissima, help me. Lo siento, perdóname, ayúdame, Santa Maria. Tina knew what Diablo meant. She had hung out for a few months with a biker club called the El Diablos, and she remembered the picture on the jackets. So she knew what he was complaining about. She pushed her devil mask to the top of her head so she could see better and patted his chest. It's OK. It's OK. I'll get you some help, buddy. He gazed, was gazing at her with parted lips, still pallid. But his breathing eased, and he quit that whimpering that seemed to come from his throat instead of his open, gasping mouth. She had planned this to be her lucky day. She wanted luck for everyone. Brad, the lollipop lady, this guy, everyone except Freddy. She patted him again and waved Lollipop back to resume the position. She was holding his hand when Brad came bounding out of the vault, laughing and shoving the teller in front of him with the nose of his gun, the paper bag plumped up with cash. Jesus Christ, put your mask back on, Tina. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Brad didn't get many opportunities to advise caution. He was the one always getting bossed around, so it felt good to lecture Tina. It made him feel in charge. Even he knew better than that. And after all, she was just Freddy's girl. He was a soldier, one of Freddy's guys, a regular pro. Get me one of those phones. We need an ambulance. Tina pushed her mask back into place. She figured the old guy probably wouldn't live to be a witness, let alone remember what happened to him or what she looked like. She hoped no one would remember her name, blurted out by Brad. Are you nuts? We're robbing a bank here, not running an ER. This was the wrong movie, not in the plan she had drilled into him. It was totally fucked up. First no manager, and now this. Yeah, Bart, Tina said, trying to impress on Brad the importance of not using each other's names. I pretty much know what we're doing. Give me one of those phones. She punched in 911 and explained the man's condition. Down, breathing, talking in Spanish so you can't tell if he's making sense or not, and gave the bank's location to the machine-like dispatcher who told her help was on the way and to stay on the line. Tina promptly turned the phone off and slid it across the room, making a bank shot off the sole of the security guy's shoe. Tina and Brad walked away from the bank, Brad practically dancing on his toes, trench coats and masks discarded in a trash bin along with Tina's gun, which she didn't expect to ever need again. As they crammed the paper bags into their backpacks, job well done, Tina could hear distant sirens. I think this is going to work, she said. In fact, the bank robbery had gone right, as well laid plans sometimes do. The getting part was over, but the getaway can take longer. It stretches from this moment to the moment when memory finally fails, from this sidewalk down which they step to the unknown horizon that moves away and never stops. They weren't just fleeing the scene of the crime. They had both done that before, or they wouldn't be here. The real getaway would be escaping from the whore's luck that had placed Tina under the protection of the heavy, punishing hand and implacable will of Freddie Napoleon. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then let's see. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A in just, I just want one more tiny little piece just to give you a flavor of it. Uh, this is about a character named Bill who owns the Happy Trout Fishing Resort, which is, uh, I think, I don't think that's a spoiler because I think it's in the blurb, you know. Um, and this is sort of his, his back story. Um, he had married young. He, he just came up to this resort to fix it because it's in disrepair. Um, and um, so this is his story of how he got there. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. OK. He had married young just a few years out of college because Barbara was pregnant and Bill wanted the baby to have a complete family. He had been pursuing Barbara steadily for months before she had let him undress her and had been first shy and then shameless with him, but never, he thought in retrospect, never really sincere. 
She had wanted to be sexy much more than she had ever wanted sex, at least with him. He remembered how troubled she had looked when she came to him with the news about the baby, but he was joyful at the possibility that this was a way to capture her elusive heart and secure her intermittent attention. He thought at the wedding that he had given his heart away completely. The white gown set off her dark cloudy hair and her dark eyes. In his memory, that was all he had seen during the whole wedding, her face, her eyes, her slender body. He supposed there had been other people there and a cake, all that falderall that had preoccupied Barbara and bored him for the last several weeks. He had thought then that his heart was completely full, but later, after months of love and misunderstandings, arguments, tears, and pride, when Rachel was placed in his arms, a pink little nothing as light as a potato chip, he realized that his heart was bigger than he had imagined. He realized that there was more to give and no end to it. And then, after a while, slowly at first, and then finally, it had ended. He would stand looking at the river, he's back of the trout, um, after a day spent in planning and repairs, rattling the stripped screws, bent nails, and odd bits of metal in his pockets, his fingers cut here and there, the skin roughened by months of work with pipes, wires, shingles, lumber, setting his house in order. Barbara would be repelled by the man he had become, had turned out to be. She had preferred the company of the other real estate agents where she worked, men she hooked up with at sales conventions and agency retreats, men dressed in trendy colors and expensive shoes, whose smooth good looks must have made him appear coarse and dull even then. After seven years or so, once she got Rachel set up in the school where the children of her friends prepared for success, Barbara started having affairs. He felt sick when he overheard her on the phone, the whispering, the cooing, the seductive purr. She had been discreet at first, but increasingly he saw the signs, her smeared lipstick and trouseled hair after getting a ride home from an associate, her endless lunches with friends, and mostly the blank mask of her face, only half concealing the excitement that bubbled there. She became reckless and the situation came to a head. He had tried not to know, tried to be more the man she wanted, until he came home one afternoon to find Barbara and her boss in his bed, not presently copulating, but lying side by side with the sheets pulled up to their armpits like Barbie and Ken dolls, tucked in for a nap by a motherly six-year-old in a state of exhausted contentment, not available to the inanimate. He knew he should just leave, but instead, perversely, he walked to the foot of the bed enjoying their horrified faces, and loomed there, wishing he had something to threaten them with besides his tall body leaning at them and the fact of his presence. He had the illusion of looking down at them from the ceiling like a wrathful light fixture. Well, this is fucking awkward, isn't it, he said. He watched the play of panic across their faces, receding, replaced by furtive planning, on the spot strategizing in which they inconveniently had no opportunity to confer. They would have to concoct separate plans. Barbara chose to wrap the sheet around her naked body and flee to the bathroom, unfortunately leaving her partner in crime entirely uncovered a poster child of vulnerability, lying naked flat on his back in a classic posture of submission at the feet of a man who had every reason to be exceedingly, perhaps violently, angry. Bill approached the side of the bed, and his wife's lover sat up and pulled Barbara's pillow into his guilty lap. Here's your pants, Bill said, standing close enough that the man couldn't swing his legs around to sit up in the usual way, but had to choose between threading his legs between Bill and the nightstand, or scooting down to the foot of the bed to get up. He couldn't flee the way Barbara had without forfeiting his pants. He scooted. There's no point in my saying anything, is there, he said, in a brave attempt to preserve his dignity. Oh, sure, Bill said. Tell me anything you want. Explain it all away and save my wife the trouble. Tell me a story that will keep me from beating the bloody crap out of you. He was shaking internally, and he felt like his heart's blood was draining out of his life. He hoped that his friendly tone came across as unnerving, if not downright menacing. The now-dressed man, having regained his Italian wool trousers, 
and his silk twill shirt, was regaining his composure. It was awkward, but not, he hoped, going to turn ugly. Unfortunately, Bill had positioned himself in front of the bedroom door, blocking the way. You're not walking out of this door, he said. You're not walking out of my house through the living room where I drink beer and watch football, past the table where my daughter and I eat breakfast, out the door where I walk when I go to work. What do you mean? Bill could see fear in the man's eyes, fears that he wouldn't walk out the door because his dead body would have to be carried out in a bag. Go out the slider like the punk thief you are. Or you can try to fight your way past me, if you, but I think you're going to get hurt bad if you do. Bill was suddenly ready to end the farce, to get the intruder out, and then to get him out himself. This was unforgivable, as he assumed it was meant to be, Barbara's indirect way of freeing herself from his boring, unwanted love. OK, so that's tucked into the middle of the novel. Um, Tina's not in it, you'll notice, and she is the protagonist. I, I think I would like to entertain questions. If you have any questions about writing or about the novel or about anything, really, the meaning of life is, is wide open. <laughs> Two. Yes, Kate. Well, it's fiction, okay? And so hardly any research. I just made it up, okay? Even though, like, race is about when you put in Tina's line of books specifically? Well, I'll tell you what I did after I wrote it, or at least a draft of it. I don't think it was the final, final, final copy. Um, I, I had two women who have been involved in the sex trade and are now at American River College, bless their hearts, and I had them read it. And I didn't know them very well. I don't even remember them. But they both read it and said, oh, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. That sounds quite reasonable. And so it's like, oh, good. And that gave me confidence to make other stuff up, basically. I've seen the movies, too, you know? Um, just like Tina and Brad going into the bank. I, I have seen the movies. Yes, Tony. Uh, well, did it turn out the way you were expecting, or were there any significant surprises? It started out as a novella because uh, my colleague Christian Kiefer said, one, in 2010, maybe 2013, I don't remember, he said, I know, let's all write novellas this summer. <laughs> and I said, OK. <laughs> and I did. I wrote a novella, and it turned out I was the only one who did of the people that said they would. I just want to, <laughs> they may have done other fine things, but they did not write a novella. And so then I realized you can't really do much with a novella, um, as far as I knew at that time. And so it was an opportunity to go back and um, fill stuff, you know. But what happened was what I expected to happen. Uh, there are a few surprises along the way. Characters come in and get important. It's like, we weren't supposed to be important, but they're interesting. So um, yeah, it, it really went the way I thought it would. Uh, I had it. But it was built out of bits and pieces from all over my life and from my students and from the movies or whatever, all of that. So it's not the pure invention in that way. Yes? Um, is there a message that you want your readers to take from this novel, or is it for pure entertainment? I want them to take first, the prostitution is not funny. Okay, that's important to me. Um, and also that people are funny. And I, I guess that's, what else is there about it? It's that if you find your place in the world, if you find where you really belong, that that is heaven. Yeah, yes. So why the subject of prostitution out of all the subjects that you could have chosen? Well, let's see. There, I can write some more stuff, too. Right? And the next thing I write will not be about prostitution, because I feel done with that. And it's not so much about prostitution as, because she gets away right away. And then what her adjustment to not being a prostitute is really what it's about. Yeah. Why that? because I was watching TV 
and I was watching The Wire, and it's a rough show, holy Toledo. And, uh, and I realized that there were a lot of women in that show who just show up and service the gang, and then they disappear. And I thought, uh, I've gotten to where I really have a hard time watching media, because it's like, OK, so that's what the guys are doing. What are the girls doing? Where's the women? What are their lives? And so I feel like I, my imagination followed this one woman as they oh, go do whatever you're going to do, shoot each other, you know, but what's going on with her? And I think that's really where it came from now that I think about it. Yeah, just to tell a story that hasn't been told that I know of. Kate? Um, is there Well, no. Actually not, because I tend to write sparsely to begin with. And so then I go back and put things in that I want. I'm less likely to have to cut than I am to add. Although people who read your book are always are saying, well, you don't need this part. And it's like, I do. I need it, you know, for me. Um, so, but, but no, I know that happens. There's sentences that dropped away and little excursions into someplace else that uh, dropped away. But for the most part, this, this is it. This is the thing. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, first there was the novella, right? That's a draft. And then I filled it in. That was a draft. And then I had my sister read it. And she made some very good remarks about it. And so I revised it again. And every time somebody read it, I revised it again. Sometimes it was just tweaks. Like I had Anara Gard, who is a, a short story writer, a friend of mine, um, read it. And she said, you have, you know how many times you use the word just? And it was like, I don't know, lots, 250 times. Because, you know, they were just arriving when she thought, I just wish. So apparently it's my go-to word, at least for this novel. Um, and so I, could, so I took some of them out. Of course, I left some, but I took some of them out that didn't have to be there. Um, Jonathan. So is the humor of the book meant to emphasize the theme of prostitution not being funny? No. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> True or false? No. Uh, not really. The humor is just because, as you know, because you're my student, I can't help it. If things are funny to me, and they, and so they end up being funny on the page. Yeah. It was like I had an evaluation from a colleague who said, I, I like the way you use humor in your class. And it was like, I can't help it. <laughs> you know, I can't, I'm not, I just can't help it. So it was a good thing they liked it, right? Instead of, wah, wah, get serious. OK. Other questions? Yes? Was this your first novel? This is my first novel, but not my last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the major thing I learned is that I can do it, and I know how to do it. Um, be well, because I've read a whole bunch of novels, for one thing, and I've thought about it, and I've written other stuff, and well, like that. But also, I have a sense of how to how to set it up for me. It's not how everyone does, and it's not how everyone should do. But it's like I know what the chapters are. So originally, this, ch this book had titles to the chapters. It was like Tina and Brad, Tina and Bill, right? And then I, I was advised, and I think it was true, that that wasn't really a good idea, but it helped me stay on, on task and know what was in each chapter. And then if I'm thinking about chapter two thing, and I think of this great scene that would happen later, I go to that, because I have a document open for that, and I put it where I think it might go. 
the, the scene or the idea for the scene, because I'll remember this scene. But so, oh, I should have that. Oh. And then once it's written and pretty much done, you kind of go through and link bits. You see places where you missed a chance to link this to something later, to kind of weave it together. 